Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to everyone here today. My name is Nikki Lee. I'm the councilwoman in Ward 4. Grateful for the opportunity to spend this afternoon with so many amazing folks. Uh, just a quick overview of Ward 4. We are in Southeast Tucson. Geographically, we are the largest ward in the city with about 100 square miles. And the Central Business District um, is not really inside of Ward 4. So I'm really excited about this opportunity because it gives me and my staff and our constituency an opportunity to learn more about what the Central Business District is and how it impacts Tucson and the greater region from an economic perspective. So we're really excited to be here today. And given all that information, my role as I see it is really to listen and to learn and understand how people are seeing the district, um, because you know we are we are out here on the edge, and we really want to understand and listen to how everyone feels about the district and hear that input. So I know that we're working together to find a balance between economics, creating value for our neighborhoods, and respecting the unique, amazing things that make up Tucson and and make it such a special place to be. So I want to thank Barbara for this opportunity and for your team. Uh, for facilitating this and we are just excited to be here today so i'm going to turn it back over to you thank you thank you oh council member lee i want to just acknowledge and honor you for your service and for your leadership they matter a lot um, and it's sometimes even more so than other times so grateful that you've chosen to stand up and let your light shine um hi everyone so i want to introduce myself my first name is punam p-u-n-a-m uh, admittedly, vowels and consonants you've probably not seen strung together before like that. Uh, let me just try to alleviate any pressure you might feel about correct pronunciation. You cannot either surprise me or hurt my feelings. Uh, it is an honor to be engaged by the city of Tucson to serve as a facilitator for what are a total of seven community convenings. Today marks the sixth of those seven. So another way to look at it is that I feel like a really lucky electron are just rotating and circulating around a remarkable, um, loving community that is Tucson. So I am grateful to be an electron around your nucleus, peeps. Uh, thank you for making time. It is Friday, and oh, what a week it's been. What a month it's been. Happy New Year. Happy January 23rd. Is Today's the 22nd, right? Yep, OK. Um, 90 minutes is what we've got together we have a desire to deliver value for you in the 90 minutes that you're giving so thank you for making time and being here a little bit of housekeeping we're recording the session and it's simply so that we don't miss a thing in our less than flawless note taking um let me just begin by answering the why we're here because i think that's always helpful so the central business district which was first adopted in 2012 was renewed by the Marin city council in september for an additional 10 years so this spring, we hope a February, March timeframe, the council will determine the future of that CBD, its potential expansion, and if they decide to expand it, what its future boundaries might be. And based on that, they will then determine how best to utilize GPLET, which is a tool, how best to use that tool and process to accomplish what it is that the community wants and desires for that CBD. Following the council's renewal of the CBD in September, they made a decision to undertake an energetic outreach effort, very simply with an intention to engage the community in providing input that would inform their decisions around potential expansion and then how best to use a GPLEC to accomplish it. So that's what brings us together. That's the why we're here. Uh, now let me address, hopefully, the how we hope to accomplish their mission of maximum community engagement throughout the process. First, we've got seven community convenings that I just mentioned to you. First one was on January 7th. The last of the seven will be tomorrow. Um, a key component of every single one of those sessions has been completion of a survey, an eight, actually nine question survey. The survey is critical because it provides, it'll provide input to the mayor and the council. Beyond the community sessions though, you may have seen this morning that the survey was available, it was printed in the newspaper. And so that's part of the outreach to the broader community to say, please provide input. Let's hear your voice, express your views. Um, so it ran today in both English and Spanish language uh, publication. It's been accessible as a PDF on the city's website since last week. So we encourage everybody to download it, to print it out. All of the ward offices have copies of it in English and Spanish. We don't want any kind of barrier. If I don't have a computer, 
let that not be a barrier. We still want to hear from folks. If I don't speak English, not a barrier. Let's get your Spanish language version. Let's get that in. Um, so that's the survey. Uh, then the goal is to encourage as many residents as we possibly can to complete that survey so that the council has the benefit of hearing from as many as possible. To that end, just as a post-it note, here's a specific call to action. Please, anyone you know, you work with, you live around, you maintain eye contact with at the grocery store, please extend the invitation for them to fill out the survey because that would go a long way. If each of us engage 10, we have dramatically exploded the quality and the vibrancy and the diversity of the input to the Merit Council. Um, in addition, tomorrow, actually, Kevin, it won't be tomorrow, it'll be Monday. In addition, on Monday, because you're attending the session today, you will receive an email directly from the city that'll give you an opportunity to share additional comments or questions that may be prompted and seeded based on the conversation today. Um, so that email will also allow you to sign up to receive additional email updates as we go through the entire process. We encourage you to, to sort of sign up, get in the minivan and let's journey this whole, uh, let's ride the whole journey together. So finally on the website, available right now is a master Q&A document. And what this represents is a, a basic assumption that says curiosity expressed by one can benefit everybody if we share the answers. It is also in keeping with the Marin Council's intention around transparency. So any question that's been posed in any of the chats, in any of the discussions through the community convenings, any of the direct input that has been in response to that day after email that we've sent, any kind of questions, comments, themes, we are summarizing them and then placing them in this master Q&A doc so that you get the benefit of other people's curiosity. So that is available right now. By the end of this month, the mayor and the council will review results from all seven community convenings, from the survey, from all of the comments and questions that are submitted uh, to the website. And they'll also receive the results of some pretty extensive academic research that they've contracted, commissioned by uh, the University of Arizona. All of that information will then be useful to them in and inform their discussions about the potential modification of that CBD boundaries and the utilization, maximum utilization, beneficial utilization of the GPLEC process. Based on their discussion, whatever consensus direction may emerge from it, we hope that somewhere by the end of February, the staff will then prepare a modified CBD boundary map as well as a modified or revised GPLAT application and policy to be presented back for ultimate action by the mayor and the council later in the spring. So that's the why. Hopefully I'm not over confused <laughs> or needlessly confused, the how, but that's the why and the how. So for today, let me now sort of anchor in today. We've got 90 now, uh, 80, I'm doing fast math be impressed 81 minutes here's we, we've got four very simple objectives for the 90 minutes that was you know, spent together one it's important that when we have a conversation about something as important as the cbd and then how to use the gplat uh, as a tool to advance the cbd it's important that we all understand and are having the conversation about the same a topic that we have a shared understanding around so one of the goals today is to level set that shared understanding of cbd and gplat that's one two we'll do a couple of short activities to discover and probe what you want, what your vision is for, the, for our community's future, and also get curious about the challenges that you believe are gonna get in our way in achieving that vision. Third objective, we'll focus on that CBD and the GPLAT, capturing your thoughts, your perspectives, your desires, priorities, and fears. All of that will be done by together, we will complete that survey together. And then finally, fourth, we will have some time at the end for open discussion to ensure that we capture all of your ideas, all of your solutions. So those are the four objectives for the now 90, 80 minutes that we have remaining. A couple of pinky promise agreements I'd love to just extract from you. Um, one, there are, let me just see what the total count is. There are 56 of us in this moment, in this call. So vigor and brevity in sharing really gonna matter. Otherwise this is gonna turn into a pajama party and we didn't have any provisions made for that. Second, please mute if you're not speaking so that when your dog barks to say how much they love you, we don't all have to hear that just to minimize the background noise. And then third, uh, for those of you that are not Zoomy, Zoomiacs, I don't know if that's a word it is now, if you're not a Zoomiac, down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little bubble that says chat. 
please feel free to use that chat. Any questions you've got, we've got, we're monitoring that chat throughout the, the time that we're together. So if they're easy to answer questions, staff is gonna be answering those in real time. If you've got thoughts that you wanna toss in there, please feel free to toss in there. And remember, anything that you put in there will be summarized as a question comment and be placed in that master Q and A document that also exists on the city's website. So feel free to use the chat. So that's it. Three little pinky promises: vigor and brevity. Right? Hit mute. We're not speaking, and please feel free to use the chat. Um, now, one really pretty cool and special feature of this entire community engagement effort are three people, three individuals who we have dubbed bridge builders, um, and their role is to do exactly that. Their role is to build bridges of engagement to all segments and sectors and places in our communities through this entire process. All three are deeply rooted in the community. They're longtime residents. They're also well-versed in the topics at hand, which I think make them very uniquely qualified to serve in the role of bridge builders. They will be assisting and providing their views to the mayor and the council as we go through the process of pre preparing recommendations for the council. Um, and what I'd like to do is to just have each of them quickly give us a shout out to say hello and give us uh, in something that resembles a shot glass, a little introduction to yourself. So we haven't got this very carefully curated. So I see Shay, so I'm gonna start with you. Shay, you wanna kick us off? Hi, yes. Uh, my name is Sharia Jimenez. I also go by Shay. Um, I've been here in the community for my family for around five generations. Um, I am a small business owner active and I'm keeping my ear to the ground to a lot of stuff. Uh, I sit on the ho housing commissions for the county and the city as well. And Shay, how long have you been here? Yeah, I uh, five generations. So yeah, a long time. Five generations. I'm not, I can't even quite wrap my head around that. I think it's, it speaks to depth of roots and devotion and commitment to a community. So thank you, Shay. Um, who would like to go next? I can go next. Go, Frankie. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Francisca Frankie Villegas. I run the Women's Business Center out of the YWCA. My background is in micro lending, working with small businesses, especially in South Tucson. And I'm here to listen, to take notes, and to make recommendations to the city of Tucson. And thank you for allowing me to participate in this process. And she means it because I happen to now have discovered that she's the best note taker I think I may have ever met in my life. So thank you, Frankie. And then uh, Mr. Poster, Corky. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Corky Poster. I'm an architect and planner with Poster McDonald. I've spent a 47 year career in Tucson working mostly in affordable housing, uh, neighborhood planning, community planning and historic preservation. Um, I um, am really honored to really be part of this bridge building and uh, we're doing our best to try to make uh, the comments and uh, the input we get be as productive as possible, looking for ways to uh, improve the support for those key topics. So thank you. That's great. It's uh, wonderful to have you and thank you for building bridges. So on to today's agenda. Four objectives. First one, shared understanding of CBD and GPLAT. That's what I declare. So to do that, uh, we've got two people who are going to walk us through some background on that central business district, the what it is, the what it's what's been happening in it to this point. So to do that, we're going to hear from two that really know their stuff. Barbara Coffey, who is Director of Economic Initiatives for your city, and Corin Manning, who is your Planning Administrator at Planning and Development Services. Um, again, any questions, post them in the chat. Take it, Barbara. All right, let's do this. Um, so thank you, Poonam. And real quickly, this is just an opportunity to uh, give you the uh, ins and outs of the Central Business District, lay the land or the foundation, so to speak. Um, on your screen, you're gonna see the map and area in red, which does represent the current, the existing Central Business District. And it was created according to state statutes. Um, it has to be a contiguous geographical boundary, and it may not be more than two and a half percent of the total land area of the city. Um, so again, on, as Puna mentioned in her introduction, we, uh, Mayor and Council did renew the existing Central Business District in September last year. So the unique thing about the Central Business District is by state statute, it allows uh, 
local government to utilize a tool we call the Government Property Lease Excise Tax or GPLET. Um, and it allows the city to attract reinvestment into the area, facilitate the development or encourage the development or redevelopment of property in that central business district. Um, and the caveat is that the properties must increase by 100% assessed valuation once development is complete. So taking a look at the 23 projects that we have had uh, since 2013 that mayor and council have approved, if you look at the numbers, um, the, the pre GPLET value of all of those 23 projects uh, so what it was on the tax rolls, all those uh, parcels together, totaling more than $40 million. Estimated post GPLET values uh, as uh, estimated when we do our economic impact analysis on those, on those projects, north of $220 million in total. And then when we did a quick review last year in advance of sharing a report with mayor and council, the 2020 assessed value total of those 23 projects um, not including those not yet constructed, but all together uh, already assessed at over $90 million. So it just gives you a sense of how that tool is working. All but five have received certificate of occupancy. So again, there are some under construction, approved or under construction. All but three developed by local entities, local development firms. And all but one uh, project, we have the one outlier that did not quite meet the 100% of valuation yet when we looked at, looked at it last year, but it's entering its fourth year in the tax abatement period and it's at 93% valuation improved. So the current program also, uh, you know, as a snapshot, gives you a sense of what was accomplished. So eight of the projects converted parking lots, five of the projects activated vacant buildings, uh, five of those also involved rehabilitation uh, or preservation of historic buildings. One project was developed over a vacant lot, but none of the projects replaced any single family residential. The pictures always do better at telling the story, so many of you will recognize some of what has happened here. This is a situation where we had a parking lot developed, and it's now the Trinity Office project that opened last year and is now leasing. Uh, this image is of what was a former Motel 6 property and certainly in a period of decline and deterioration. And last year, in the middle of a pandemic, the Tuxin Boutique Hotel opened up, July 4th weekend, I believe it was. And uh, so now you have uh, a renovated property um, where there was much deterioration. So again, this one harks back to an historic rehabilitation opportunity. This was a structure built in 1952 and was the site of the first Baptist church school, I believe. And it became the headquarters for Mr. Carwash in the community. And so again, something of an eyesore becomes an icon in downtown. Uh, speaking of icons, this is one of the tallest or the tallest building in Tucson, uh, One South Church, but right there on the hard corner is what transformed uh, most recently when the Rendezvous Urban Flats opened up last year. Uh, this is 100 residential units now in downtown, along with many others uh, that have been under construction that really help provide that 24-7 community to support local businesses right in and around them. But it's not all rosy. So when we think about the challenges with the GPLET program, you know, I shared with you some of the, you know, the images of, of projects that have been developed and the good that's come, but, but it's not without heartache and it's not without challenge. And I would say that one of the things that uh, has struck us most um, is the, uh, the designation that's required by statute to create the Central Business District, utilizing the language uh, of slum and blight. Uh, it's, it's very uncomfortable. It's almost offensive at times. Uh, neighbors and residents and don't like the idea that their neighborhood is, is designated as such. And so it becomes a challenge, one that I hope that uh, at some point we can change at a, at a later date with the work with our legislators. Um, the other piece about the GPLED is that it is one tool, one program, and I would just share with you that it alone does not create all the problems, nor does it solve all the issues. So again, keeping that in mind, uh, it is one tool uh, for attracting development. Um, and then finally, the affordable housing projects that you may hear about or that are certainly on the forefront 
as a priority for mayor and council, as a priority for what is needed in terms of housing options, um, the GPLET tool may not be um, the, you know, accessible for those projects. And so there are um, other programs that may help, uh, such as the low income housing tax credits and other programs that would uh, be beneficial for those. So with that, I want to turn it over to my partner in planning and development services to share a little bit more uh, with you about the tools and things that also have helped us along in terms of development in the Central Business District. So Corin. Thank you, Barbara. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. I am Corin Manning, uh, Planning Administrator for City of Tucson in Planning and Development Services. And as Barbara mentioned, the Central Business District and the GPLET tool um, does not uh, work on its own. And it's actually designed to work in concert with other tools and programs in the city. So I want to just briefly touch on some of those other tools namely um, zoning regulations and specifically the infill incentive district. Um, as these, um, that program is often paired with the central business district and the GPLET to get projects off the ground. So um, we have a number of tools as a city to support sustainable infill development. Um, some of those are transportation investment, zoning regulations, and then financial incentives like the GPLET. Um, in terms of transportation, obviously the biggest transportation investment our city has seen in recent years, particularly in our downtown area, is the streetcar. Um, that came about as a result of decades of advocacy by community members and elected officials. And when that major investment in our community was put in place, uh, the city wanted to make sure that we could truly capitalize on that transportation investment by making sure that we had the right zoning and financial incentives in place to allow more transit oriented development and mixed use development in our downtown area to really drive ridership and allow people to, to uh, make the most of that streetcar, use that um, by bringing more housing and jobs to downtown. Um, so transportation investments are a really big piece of the puzzle. Um, uh, zoning is another big piece. Zoning controls what can be built on a site, so can influence either, um, you know, more low density sprawling development or more urban um, mixed use transit oriented development, which is what we have tried to promote in our downtown area through tools like the Infill Incentive District. And then lastly, financial incentives. The Central Business District and the GPLED is what we're here to talk about it, and it's one of the um, most powerful tools we have as a city, but there's other financial incentives as well. Uh, for example, Rio Nuevo uh, Tax Increment Finance District is another source of funding for a lot of projects in our downtown area. So all of these are meant to work together to support more sustainable urban infill development in our downtown area. So as I mentioned, um, one of the tools that is most commonly used in our downtown area is the Infill Incentive District. It's been used by a lot of the same projects that used the GPLET incentive. So I want to just briefly touch on what it is and the distinct role of the infill incentive district. Both of these tools are meant to work together, but they play a different role in shaping these projects. Um, so the IID is an optional zoning overlay. Projects that use this tool, um, the incentive is to build more uh, transit oriented mixed use development that really enhances the streetscape and brings more activity to our downtown area. These projects have to meet certain design standards and historic preservation regulations um, in order to protect that historic fabric that makes our downtown area so unique. And this tool uh, was established by Mayor and Council in 2010. It has evolved over time. So just like we are looking at the Central Business District now and reevaluating this tool um, and hoping to, to make some modifications moving forward, the IID has also evolved over time. So um, a precursor to the IID allowed um, student housing developments to use this tool. That was not in line with what um, the community wanted and what was really envisioned as the purpose and goals for this tool. So Mayor Council made some changes in 2015 um, to require that any group dwelling or student housing project would need to go through a special exception by Mayor and Council in order to use this incentive. Since then, no student housing projects have requested that exception. Um, so that's one way that this 
tool evolve to meet the changing needs of our community. Um, this is a map of the downtown and full incentive district. I want to share this just to show that this is very similar to the geography of the central business district. Um, and that is, again, by intent so that these tools can work together. Um, it covers the downtown area primarily, but also extends along a few key commercial corridors. Um, you see it follows Oracle, South, um, South Sixth Avenue, um, and then along the I-10 frontage. Um, and I want to point out what this does not include um, is residential neighborhoods. The IID does not cover the core areas of, of residential neighborhoods because it's meant to drive more um, higher density mixed use development on our commercial corridors. Uh, the IID has been used to facilitate um, dozens of projects. Over 40 projects have used it. It's um, helped spur over 1,500 new housing units for the greater downtown area. That includes hundreds of units of senior and affordable housing and has helped create over half a million square feet of commercial space, offices, retail, hotels, um, the other job intensive uses in our downtown area. I want to point out that a lot of the projects that use the infill incentive district are actually actually what we call minor projects. These are usually smaller scale projects and they are this allows a lot of our small local businesses to stay in the downtown area maybe expand their footprint slightly in a way that is sustainable for them some of the businesses that have used this are serious visual sand reckoner time market press to coffee so a lot of the the stalwarts of our of our downtown area so a couple visuals of um, before and after with um, what the iid has has helped achieve for our downtown area so this is Stone and Broadway, very prominent intersection in downtown, two major corridors. This is 2011, so before the streetcar, um, we had on the left there kind of an outdated office building, another one-story office building, very low rise um, next to it, and then a surface parking lot, which was pretty common in downtown at that time. We had a lot of surface parking, so not, um, not a really high intensity use of those sites. Um, as a result of the IED, we have two new projects on these corners. On the left, that's the Westerner and West Point. It actually is 50 units of affordable senior housing. That was built on the site that had kind of a one-story commercial building. And then that office building was rehabbed. It's, um, it was preserved, that is a historic building, and the IED allowed that to be um, rehabbed and preserved in place with new housing next door. You can see that's right on the streetcar, so this allows people to take the streetcar to get to work, to get to their apartments. On the other corner is One West Broadway. That's also a mixed-use project that has 40 units of housing um, above a ground floor medical office, so bringing needed amenities and services to our downtown area, again, right along the streetcar. Here's an example of one of those smaller business um, projects that's gone through the IID. This is a serious visual. This is on North Stone, just a bit north of downtown. It was an auto use that had closed, so it was a vacant site. And then using the IID, they were able to, um, serious visual was able to relocate their business, transform this site, adaptively reuse it, um, and turn it into new offices for their business, allowing their business to expand and stay in the downtown area. Um, this project also um, did use the GFLET, so that was the other component that allowed this project um, to get off the ground. So just a few examples of how the IID, um, which controls the zoning, and then the GPLET, which provides the financial incentives, can work together um, to support a lot of, the, do work together to support um, the development that we see in downtown, large and small. And with that, back to you, Punam. Great, thank you. Um, all right, ready to do some work? Open up the chat. So it's that little bubble down at the bottom, open it up. I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna limit your response to one word. Sorry about that. That's the vigor and brevity part of the program, one word. Here's the question. Um, think about city of Tucson, community of Tucson a decade from now. So we are here January 23rd, 2021, go out to something that's 2031-ish a decade from now. Think about that place. What adjective would you like to claim as a description of that community, of that place in 2030? I'm going to ask it a couple of different ways. What for you will be true 
about the community of Tucson in 2030. What promise do you want to deliver to the baby that isn't born yet, who will be having his or her ninth birthday party then? Right, think about the vision. What is your vision in one word for your community looking forward? Beautiful words, energetic. Um, Elizabeth Johnson, that is an awesome adjective to describe to a community. Tell me in vigor and brevity, what does it mean to you? Describe that place. I guess I'd say I'm looking for it to be more shops, more vibrant, more energetic from the standpoint of, you know, a lot of restaurants have closed down down here. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the shops have closed and to become more of an energetic wannabe downtown because things are happening. Okay, then I'm gonna carry your baton and hand it to, to Rosemary who used the word vibrant, which is sort of a little bit of what I heard. So Rosemary, tell us a bit of what vibrancy means. I think, I, I think to me, it means busy and bustling and successful and um, happy. And happy, busy and successful and happy. Wow, what awesome words for community, huh? Um, so Robert Lang, Robert Lamb, sorry. Attractive, describe what that means to you. Attractive to people who want to live, work and play there. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. So the magnet is strong for that community, for that place. It's vibrant, it's dynamic, it's energetic. There's something for everybody and it's alluring and interesting and attractive. It brings me in. Okay, I wanna move there maybe. Um, Oh, Wilda, opportunity. Give us a thimble full of what that means to you. I'd like to see Tucson be a place where um, everybody is included in the opportunities of the day, you know, of the era. You know, whether it be regardless of what sector you come from. Thanks. The promises that we just talked about what you are envisioning is that that's a promise that will be equally kept and delivered for everybody. Yes, thank you. Yeah, beautiful. Bold. Swain, what's bold mean to you? Swain, you didn't just throw your word and then run, did you? Or you just unmute yourself, maybe? I'm sorry. Bold to me means that our downtown will be more than just a mid rise community. We want it to be vibrant. All of, all of what's already been said, but we want it to really stand out. We want it to be the attraction for our community because downtown, you're 30 minutes from any part of community from Pima County. So if you want an office downtown, you want it to be bold, you want it to be vibrant, you want it to be community. Yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, you have defined a place that is uh, a place we all want to work towards creating. So what you see here is just a summary of what you said, right? So the larger the word, it just means the more frequently it showed up. So look at that amazing place. That's where we're going to be living. That's the promise we're going to deliver. That's what we're going to work together to create it collectively, right? Inclusive, vibrant, e equitable, energetic. It's gorgeous, that place. All right, second question. Same rules. In chat, one word limit. Sorry. Um, but now here's the question is, we are realists. So yes, we need a vision. Yes, we want to have some clear North Star. And then we need to be pragmatic about the challenges, the stuff that's going to get in the way. So here's the question. In a single word, what do you think is the biggest challenge we will face in achieving that amazing vision? This gorgeous place that we just articulated. What is it that we're going to have to work through? What is it that we're going to have to deal with, manage? Um, what's going to test us to get there? Let's see what those words are. So Elizabeth Johnson, economics, tell me what that means. Well, especially right now with COVID, with so many businesses having to kind of shut down or redo their work, um, I think that there's going to be changes in how work is done and how stuff is done. And I think that eventually that's going to truly show up as an economic change and our 
processes of doing things are going to be different going forward than they are today. We're going to have to face those. So affording the whole thing will be different. Got it. Mike, how does growth get in our way? How is that a challenge? Challenge? Well, I came here in 1980 and uh, it had that small town kind of feel to it as well as just general business attitude to me. And then from the 80s until now, you know, I noticed it, the build, the build up as well as the build out. And I'm concerned about uh, growth, uh, not necessarily going too fast, but maybe leaving out people, leaving out businesses, leaving out opportunities. Yeah, um, yes, and part of what you've got as a community is a richness and diversity, right? That is absolutely a supremely treasurable asset. And so sometimes if I grow too fast, I forget, right? Yeah who I am, where I came from, and all that is spectacular about me. Um, Chase, tell me a bit what regionalism means. How is that a challenge? So it, I think it deals with vibrancy, like Rosemary was talking about. I think there's certainly an aspiration that's amongst this group um, and an energy and that I think can absolutely be attained. However, I think it's going to take partnerships that might be outside of the immediate region of Tucson. And I think that's okay. I think we just have to be careful in how we reach out and expand um, that that grasp, if you will, to accomplish those desires. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Randy, not thinking big enough. Um, you didn't even use hyphens to try to get that into one word compliance, but it's a cool, it's a cool thought. So share a little bit more about that. Well, I think as a community, we often squabble about details and forget that in the big picture, we have almost a 25% poverty rate which is unconscionable and that many of these programs and the things that people are trying to do are to create opportunity in all parts of Tucson and for generations. And so for me, it's often frustrating that we don't have a vision for a better uh, tomorrow where there's opportunity and we can really chip away at that terribly high poverty rate. It's an important reminder, uh, really important reminder. When I get up in the morning, not once have I ever woken up in the morning and said, today my aspiration is to be middle of the road. Lots of times that is my action. I end up something that's middle of the road, but my aspiration is always bold and big and compelling and gorgeous. Um, so that's a really important, yeah, we think big. Um, that's great. All right, you did well. So you can see the words. That is your word cloud. Next thing, now we're gonna abandon the chat and we're gonna go into um, the survey. We're gonna stroll through the survey question by question together. Here's how it's gonna work. We've got a test question. Let's put that up now. And what you'll see is a text box show up in the middle of your screen. There is a question, please answer the question. The second that you've selected an answer, your submit button will hit turn red, you hit it. It's that easy. So let's see how you did on the first. It's not a trick question, it's just a test question. So let's see how you did it. And we will all see together exactly, oh, thank God, look how well we're doing. You're, we are on a roll. This is a very, very high performing crowd, I can tell. Next question, please. How long have you lived in Tucson? And sorry, five generations is not a response. It's an option, Shay. Yeah, so this has been a trend. We've now had six community engagement. The length of time that people have devoted and loved your community is astonishing. I am coming to you live from Henderson, Nevada, which is a suburb of Las Vegas, Nevada. 3% of the 2 million plus that live in the Valley were born and raised here, 3%. That's sort of the, yeah. So everyone here is from somewhere else. So I look at what you've got here and it's just an extraordinary thing. Um, next question, please. Do you live within the existing CBD? Uh, 
Uh, well, okay, so there are 62 of us on this call. So 20% means close to a dozen apparently do live in there. Good. Um, I want to hear from you. So those of you that live there, please unmute your voice button. Um, I don't mean literally unmute because there'll be time. Most of these questions you'll see are self-explanatory, but there's some that are juicy for conversation. Next question, please. So what brings you to the CBD or to downtown Tucson? And here, please check as many as apply. Yeah, so Councilwoman Lee, I will tell you that we're seeing a theme here, and that is that there's uh, lots of different reasons that people go. It's not a single, it's not a single promise destination. Um, there's a lot of eating, drinking, fellowshipping, hanging out, shopping, enjoying time and space. Is what we've, those are the themes that we've seen. Thank you. Next question, please. Okay, think about the streetcars. So the streetcars influence on downtown Tucson in your estimation has been? Yeah, again, so you know, 55% gave it a very positive. If I add in that those that view it as somewhat positive, that's 80%. That's sort of the, the consistency that we've seen now through six meetings. Um, next question, please. Uh, Council Member Lee and her peers, they have identified affordable and workforce housing as a central and a key critical priority. Which statement best reflects your opinion of their priority? Great. So um, a few, Council Member Lee, that is a strong affirmation from your public that uh, you've got their priorities at heart. This is a 95%. We got your back. We support the priority response. Um, I think, Corky, do we want to probe a little bit more? Yeah, we do. Um, Frankie and Shay and I really have thought about from this point on in the meeting to get kind of a deeper dive and get a lot more feedback about some of the issues. Uh, I've done a lot of affordable housing and um, wanted to talk a little bit about um, other ways that we might be doing that. Keep in mind that the Central Business District is a geographic area designated by the city of Tucson. And we've seen that the GPLED is one tool that exists in that Central Business District. And the uh, Infill Incentive District, the IID, as Corin explained, is, is another tool that uh, help us um, realize the goals we want for the Central Business District. But there are a lot of other goals and perhaps those other goals need other tools. So one of the things that we're gonna talk about now and for probably a good part of the rest of the meeting is what other things do we need and how do we make the tools that we have better? Um, I'm gonna focus on affordable housing now, but we'll be uh, dealing with some additional topics uh, later on. The only fact I wanted to give you about the affordable housing that Corin mentioned is that 98% um, of affordable housing that's built in the country is built through the low income housing tax credit program. And the low income housing tax credit program works by an equity investor owning the property and taking tax credits over a period of time. The GPLET works by um, the city of Tucson owning the property for an eight year period 
and getting essentially tax credits during that period. Those are mutually exclusive. They, you can't have two different owners at the same time. So unfortunately, those programs don't work together. Um, but I'd like to open the conversation about what other ways we might be able to achieve the clear priority that you expressed in this last question to improve affordable housing in Tucson. Uh, I think we can be a little casual and yeah. folks just speak up one at a time. We repose your question, Corky. Well, uh, the previous question that we just answered said that almost everyone on this call strongly agrees that affordable housing is a high priority. Um, and my question to the group is, how do we make that happen? Uh, what kinds of tools do we need? And what is the nature of the affordable housing that you all wanna see? So Randy, why don't you start? Sure, um, so I think that there are a few issues. I mean, first we talk about affordable housing, but um, downtown there is quite a bit of low income housing. And what we're really missing is the workforce housing. Um, for people who are just, just at that level, um, which is where downtown and, and really a, a lot of Tucson is becoming unaffordable. I hope that with the Biden administration, there are more programs um, that we can use and money that we will be available. I hope that the state legislature focuses on this because it's a, a, a very real issue. Um, but those projects don't get developed without funding mechanisms. Um, we can tap into opportunity zone funds, which really have not been used that much um, downtown yet, but they're probably not enough to close the gap between the very high construction costs and the rents that you need to get um, to be able to get any kind of financing on a project. I don't know if the city or the state could create different financing mechanisms, but it's really all an equation um, that just doesn't work right now. So we need more tools. And part of the reason I'm so passionate about the GPLET and the Central Business District is because it's one of the only tools at our disposal. And while we can't use it for affordable housing right now, that doesn't mean that we could not get language changed at the legislature or um, even waivers from the federal government. So I don't think we should just write the, the, that off as being impossible to have a GPLET and LIHTC funds. Thank you. That's great, thanks. And Randy, I also heard you make an interesting delineation between low-income housing, workforce housing. And so is that a recommend, I mean, is that an input that you would give to the mayor and council is to get sort of delineate and focus on different kinds of affordable housing? You know, there's a housing shortage in general and Tucson, which used to be very affordable, um, is getting less and less so. So there's more housing needed of all different kinds. And while in the, specifically in the downtown area, um, Corky once did a great interview on the radio and talked about how low-income housing was really focused on downtown before anything else. And it continued to be built. I don't know the number of low-income units that we have, but what's really missing in and around the downtown area is more of that workforce level. Um, but we need, we need more at every level. Great. So there were two of you that I saw, I thought your necks might hurt because you were nodding so emphatically. Let me just quickly, if it's okay, Corky, I saw Robert Lamb, you sure. were emphatic. And um, is it Kira or Kyra? Kira, Kira? yeah. Kira. So please add whatever it was that made you do this because you were doing that. Yeah, I just totally agree with Randy 100%. It's really, there are no um, products out there to bring work, workforce housing to the table. And during the recession, we saw an enormous amount of low income built in the downtown area, which is great, but they're the part of the population that isn't being served, that's neglected by the inability to provide workforce housing. And those instruments just don't exist for developers. We tried really hard at West End Station to, to make it a workforce product, but it's, 
it's a mix, but mainly low income product. Okay, so it's diversification of the tools. And Mr. Yeah. Lamb, you were, did you have some? No, I also agree. Um, I think that there's that, that gap of workforce uh, that needs to be there. Um, I'm a big proponent of let's, let, you know, let's get jobs. You know, once you've got jobs and people who want to live and work downtown, let's give them that opportunity. So we can fill that, that donut hole that exists uh, that Randy described. I think we'd be much better off. That's great. Work anymore? Should I keep moving on to the next question? No, I guess the only other, the only other prompt I would, I would like to do is talk about uh, housing within neighborhoods. I mean, we talk about sort of uh, multi-story housing and there's a fair amount of that and certainly uh, something we need, but I'm wondering what folks think about the housing stock in neighborhoods and the affordability of that. Hi, this is Jay Young. I have a comment, I guess, really about both, if I may. Um, okay. Hi, um, I, I just think it's really important to note, and I'm glad you did, Corky, about how much of the affordable housing really is uh, possible because of federal funding. And I think it really makes it hard for communities like Tucson to, to really have an impact. But I do think it's critical that the city really have a comprehensive plan to do what it can. I feel like there's not ever been a real, real comprehensive plan about how to uh, get more affordable housing and to really look at what tools are available to local government and really uh, push on those levers so that whatever we can do, we are doing. And then, you know, talking about uh, the impact on neighborhoods, um, you know, we just need more housing in general. I mean, across the board at all different income levels. I mean, if you look at the research, um, we're just very underbuilt from, from all different levels. Um, knowing that we're going to have more housing built in many different places, including established neighborhoods, you know, again, I think it's just critical also that we're protecting folks who have lived in these neighborhoods for, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, five years or five generations, um, really putting tools in place so that um, folks who want to continue to live where they've been living are able to do so uh, and are not priced out um, of their neighborhood. So, you know, I think it's a real delicate balance, but again, um, having a comprehensive approach and strategy to that is, is just critical. And, you know, I think uh, uh, one place to look is, is the city of Phoenix. I, you know, I know we in Tucson hate to do that, but uh, they have put together a, a, a relatively comprehensive plan about how to actually get uh, tens of thousands of units of affordable housing uh, into the city. So we need to have a big kind of big plan, a big idea um, that that's what we want to do as a community. Without that, I don't, I don't think we'll, we'll do it and it will continue to get worse in terms of affordability. Great. Thank you, Jay, that's super helpful. So I'm gonna move us to the next question, if that's okay. Corky, uh, let's have the next question up, please. Thank you, that was a rich input. All right, in addition to affordable workforce housing, what other types of investment would you like to see the mayor and council prioritize for the downtown area? And here, please scroll, because there's a few answers that you can't see initially. Select as many as apply. So we know what the first priority is. What should the second, third, and fourth priority be? Some very thoughtful responses, apparently. There we go. So your number one is renovation and reuse of existing buildings, followed pretty closely by safer streets, better connectivity, and then almost in a tie, residential rental and retail. Okay, that is valuable input and guidance to your mayor and council. Um, last question, please. Oh, sorry, second last question. What, now thinking about the geographic area, what areas around downtown should the mayor and council focus on for investment?
In the last question, there was an emphasis on uh, public spaces as well that was uh, down at the bottom of the list. Correct. Ms. Binda? Are you confirming that? That is correct. All right. Wow. So there's kind of some rich diversity in this answer, right? So if I look at things over 50%, there are two South 6th Avenue, five points, America Mile, the, ten, the five, and then closely behind between 40 and 45. I-10 frontage, North 4th Avenue, downtown links, west of I-10, Mercado District. Okay, thank you. Last question, please. And we want to engage your ideas and solutions on this, this one too. Um, pretty important question. What types of community benefits should accompany GPLET assisted development projects in the CBD? You're given advice to the Mayor and Council, so what is it you want to make sure that they're maximizing in terms of community benefits? Okay, so there's a strong theme, Council Member Lee, I will tell you, and that is that small and local business job created, creation matters to everybody, it seems like. Um, look at that, followed very closely by increased attainable housing options. So I'm going to now shift your thinking into the, so how do we do it? Whatever your priority was, how do we do it? Because the idea, like we know that there's ways to do it, we just got to sort of innovate our way through it, right? And so with all of the bridge builders, we got our catcher smiths ready. We're ready to take notes, share ideas, share ideas. How do we do it? I mean, Frankie, you're the, the sort of energizer bunny in terms of small business provision of opportunity. Do you want to probe the first? Because that was the number one response. You're right. So in the past um, couple of meetings and tomorrow we have the last meeting, Small businesses, job creation, it's been a, a consistent um, issue for the expansion of the central business district. So I would love to hear ideas, recommendations. Um, Sack, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know you, you know, you're very knowledgeable. Would you mind sharing with us if you have any ideas, any recommendations? What do you think? For how to for how to see more small business development in the expansion of the central business district yeah what other tools should be included or other benefits to help small businesses right right i mean i can um you know i can speak to um i can speak to not I, it's not a menlo park neighborhood position i want to be clear on that but our neighborhood did meet a few months back about the central business district uh, and there's a piece of it that is either within then lower could be expanded and many folks were saying look we'd love to see the gplet uh, support small business and local business development along grande and congress would love to see those corridors and so it was less of an anti-position and more of can we strategically see the gplet as a um as either a a carrot for encouraging uh, developers to develop with an eye towards small business development um, or to see it as a way that we can support more people um, in, in, in having their local businesses supported. Um, and I think, I think the perception of GPLED is that it goes to a certain size of developer development, um, but does it have to be that way? And so seeing the GPLED as a driver of the kind of development we want to see um, rather than scrapping it all together. And again, I wanna be clear that is not an association position. Um, that's a small group conversation um, that was had because we have a lot of small businesses on the west side in Menlo Park uh, and, and many that would like to stay and to thrive but need resources as well. 
Are there, do we have any people on this call who happen to own a business within the central business district? Any small business owners? Whether you're in the district or not? Kira, I know you're there. So. Yeah, I'm there. Um, yeah, so I I haven't actually benefited from the GPLAT. I developed the Mercado San Augustine and the expansion of the MSA Annex. Um, and I will say that, you know, when people put together the GPLAT, they must have really known what small businesses and small developers would need to get going because the Mercado struggled for seven years to be able to make enough income to cover our property taxes. It's almost exactly the length of the G plat. So I thought I thought that was very interesting. The annex is uh, benefiting through a similar mechanism, but not through the G plat. But I will say, you know, as a developer, those expenses are passed to your tenants, which are the small businesses that you're trying to nurture. So they, you know, developers should be educated on how to present that to their partners. So when they come along they realize they're gonna have this eight year benefit that's pretty significant. It's a huge savings. And probably that would encourage people to take more risks, sign more lease, you know, longer lease terms and, and those kinds of things. It would, it's an aid for the developers. And I agree with Zach, I would love to see businesses on Grande and that whole area benefit from this. It should be for small. And I will add also when, when I started out doing the Mercado, there were a lot of micro lending organizations and I know of fewer and fewer of them. And I, I think Mac Southern Arizona Micro Advancement Business Center, when they went away, I don't know that they ever were properly, nobody really stepped in their place. So for, for the smaller businesses that really would benefit that for some reason can't get an SBA loan those micro lenders, we I would love to see some of those come back through the nonprofit world. So it, it, to replay what I think I just heard you say, to, to give the capacity to local businesses to be able to seize the opportunity. Is that what yeah. you mean? Yeah. yeah Punam, I, I, I think maybe make it a little bit more clear. What I heard from some neighbors, again, not a neighborhood association statement is, there's this feeling that the city council passively reviews um, GPLET applications. What if it was flipped? Um, what if um, the, the GPLET and the CBD was seen as more a part of a strategic vision for the, the entire planning of the area? And to go out and basically say, look, this is what we wanna see. How do we let, you know, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's small business, whether it's small development, that there is actually a, a, a campaign to say, this is what we think the GPLET can support. We'd like to go out and let companies and organizations and people know that they maybe can't use it, that they can. And to be proactive about saying, there are these resources, like Kira said, to get you up off the ground faster. And so have more of an active and strategic um, effort around the GPLET rather than just um, a passive one for those who know about it. Got it, got it. Got so, um, Zach, do you have specific recommendations? Because I feel like I'm tomorrow we have our last meeting, and I want to have specific recommendations to the city that you know those tools that are going to help small businesses. So, anything in specific that you want me to recommend to the city to improve the central business district, the expansion. Hmm. Nothing's coming to me super quickly. Can I put things in the chat as they come to mind? Yeah, of course. And because we know that as you go to sleep tonight, you're going to be like, oh, yeah. And then I just thought of <laughs> that's why that email is coming to you Monday. And it's not a 140 character limit. You can put in anything you want. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's no deadline on great ideas, just to be clear. Anybody else? Do we have a small business owner that went through the problem other than Kira? Thank you for sharing. Um, that had a positive, that has ideas. Um, at this point, I think Shay Corky and I are looking for specific recommendations that we can include in our report to the city. Hi, Mike Kasser. I have a we have used GPLAT several times. Um, we had the McCormick apartments, which we built, and then also um, 
Oh, sorry, I can't remember. things don't come like that. But anyway, we've used it very successfully. But the key from an investor's point of view is uh, you need, we needed it for, to, to achieve the return to be able to raise the money to go ahead and do the project. So it's all, it all comes together with, uh, in, in that particular way. And so you have to be clever to figure out what you can do and what you can't do. Then you approach the, the, the banks and see if you can raise the money. We are, um, believe it or not, building uh, uh, workforce housing in Phoenix. And we're on our third or fourth project. No, no, no government financing, not zero. And, uh, uh, but it, 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 the numbers work out so you can get the, you can, you can borrow the money. And that is, so a lot depends on the land cost, uh, which is number one. And, uh, but it's not downtown. Downtown Phoenix is very expensive. So you have to look on the outskirts and, and you can, and I, and I actually were looking at a couple of uh, properties right here in Tucson. They're in, in the southern part of the city, but uh, and I think they're going to work out for us. But uh, just want to add that little, little bit. Corky knows all about this this stuff. Uh, you know, he's he's crushed all the numbers many times, right, Corky? <laughs> nice to see you. Like I'm going to assume, and correct me if this is an incorrect assumption, that as a developer, you made a best effort to also provide opportunity to small local owned businesses. Did you? In the projects that you worked on? Of course. Yeah? You're on mute. Opportunity, because if you're doing something, people come to you and say, look, I need a job. Right. I get a job. And we, and we, it's like a mutual thing, you know, they need the job. We need the people and it works out quite well. So, so from your vantage point, yes. do you have any specific ideas of, of ways in which those businesses who came to you could have been better prepared, better set up, better supported? Well, you've got a unique vantage point is why. Well, we talk, we talk extensively. I have to come back. Excuse me, my takes priority, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, what was your question? I'm sorry. Oh, just from your vantage point, are there ways in which the small businesses that were approaching you for opportunity, are there ways that they could have been game day readier? Well, just, you got a different uh, perspective. It has to do with uh, having a business plan. So uh, the better your business plan, the more chance you have of success. And we take we take risks too. We do venture capital investing, so sometimes we take risks. But the, and there's a whole venture capital uh, world here in Tucson. Um, we have the uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, this was at a meeting. Uh, you know, when you talk to 50, an 80 year old, things are tough. Uh, we have a, a group of people that meet once a once a month. Uh, Those are angels. What? Those are angels. <laughs> Desert Angels, there you go. Lucinda, she read my mind. And we meet and we have, there's lots of opportunities. The, the, the process is really, you, um, you have an idea and then you, you submit it to a committee of the, uh, of the Desert Angels and they look at, look at it. Now you may, they may say, look, you're not, you, you're, you're, you have a good, great idea, but you gotta develop it more. How are you gonna raise, you know, raise money? How are you gonna, et cetera, et cetera. The business plan. We all, I assume most people know about business plans. And if you don't, I think the Desert Angels even have um, chances to learn about how to do a business plan. So um, uh, anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Robert's got his hand up. This is a follow up to, to Mike Kasser question. Um, when you evaluate projects and look for investment, obviously the GPLET helps fill a gap uh, to be able to make it pencil out well for the investors who are looking for a particular return, but you're also looking at minimizing risk. Um, is there anything that you can see that would the city could do 
to lower the risk level to make those projects more attractive to your financing partners? Well, it's all, it's all in the numbers. So um, it has to do, I mean, for example, if the land were less expensive, lower the cost of land, but uh, it's tough, you know, it's not impossible, but uh, production costs are pretty, uh, uh, work, work went down and they're back up and they're gonna go down again maybe uh, if we have another mini recession. Uh, so that's the time to buy the land so you can hold it and build as soon as uh, the opportunity comes back again. Mr. Kasser, you had said uh, a few moments ago that I think if I heard you right, that some of these housing projects that you're working on in Phoenix didn't require financial incentives. Is that basically because uh, median income in Phoenix is, is that much higher? What, what made those projects self-sustainable like that? Well, part of it is the rent. But part of it is the, is the price of the land. And part of it is we have a partner that has done an ex excellent job of des designing the, the property, the, the, the housing itself and minimizing costs. So I think we can, we feel that we built for 20 to 25% less than most, uh, most builders. And it's still a very uh, good uh, uh, house or apartment. So, you know, and, and we're, we're filling them up, we're, it's, it's, they're doing well. I mean, we just fully rented our first one. And uh, so we're very happy and now we're under construction two or three more. That's great. Mike, I wanna jump to Tana who's had her hand up so patiently for quite a while. Take it. Hey, um, so I just wanted to bring up again, I know I've talked in other sessions about this, but to add to that list for uh, community benefit agreements um, to be worked into the GPLET. Um, moving forward, because Historic Fourth Avenue Coalition was basically formed to create one of these uh, CBAs with the union project at 6th and 4th. And they did it in a way that the project or the, the agreement sticks with that building. It's not just the current owners. Um, they were able to work as a coalition of businesses, the neighborhood associations, the neighbors themselves, and really come up with you know, ideas for the developers and the developers worked with them on it. And they were able to come up with you know, stuff about the building, uh, how they were gonna handle the rentals, what they were going to include in the project that was important to the neighborhoods and the surrounding businesses. So I think moving forward to have that resource available for the neighborhoods, because Patrick alluded to you know, having trust and everybody's voices heard in the chat, well, you have to really be able to afford that to the people in the neighborhoods and the business districts that you're building in and, and make sure that that sticks with the property. Because I think West University neighborhood saw it with um, the district, they, they built the student housing and they, promised a lot of things to the neighborhood, but those didn't go along with the building. And when they sold the building, those promises weren't kept. And, um, you know, there were speed bumps that never got installed. And, and I think that people felt they were just disappointed because they really wanted to see that, you know, symbiotic relationship happen if the development's going to hit in the neighborhood. So moving forward to have because it's not a cheap thing to do you need lawyers involved you need to have a lot of investment um so if the city can provide some resources that would allow neighborhoods and businesses and you know coalitions to come together and have their voices heard in future developments i think that you would see a lot of things that that would be beneficial even in the development itself to to keep the flavor of the neighborhood um, to keep people happy, to have projects that really make sense in areas. So, no, that's, thank you. That's a Thanks. very thorough and complete suggestion. Appreciate it. Thank um, you. So Kylie, you've got a provocative notion that you stuck into the chat. I'd love you to just toss it out and see how everyone feels. Here's what she wrote As other communities are aggressively remo removing parking requirements and higher density developments that are located along transit corridors. And I'm just curious. 
how this could help development from an affordability standpoint. So what do we say, community? Anyone have any insights? Or Kylie, do you wanna add any more to that? No, it seems like there was robust discussion in the chat and I appreciate people taking the time to answer that question. It really was just a, more of a question of yeah. out of curiosity, but I, you know, I do notice that in the poll, one of the community benefit questions couples transit and parking as a community benefit together. And I just, I'm curious why those are coupled together um, because I think investment in transit and parking simultaneously uh, sort of defeats the purpose of encouraging people to use transit. Got it. Um, there was no master design to the question. Um, but I think you raised that's an interesting um, line of inquiry, right? And curiosity, which will um, relate to the council, the Marion Council. Kylie, I think sometimes we hear that people want to drive downtown park and then take the streetcar. That might be, but I think as Poonam said, we were just kind of grouping by category. So I know, for example, Fourth Avenue, there has been interest in parking. And I think for some people that is linked to streetcar usage. People could park in a garage and then, you know, use a streetcar to get around the downtown area. Okay, any other ideas? specific things that the mayor and council, you want them to contemplate as they're thinking about community, maximizing community benefits. This is a Wilda. Um, hi, I would like, I would, hi. I would like to see um, more outreach to smaller business folks. Um, and, you know, I think we need to think about the definition of what a small business is, because, um, for example, the, you know, the money, the CARES Act money that, that was put out there and designated, um, I learned from Pelosi that to our government, small business is 25 or more employees. And so that alone um, excludes a lot of small business owners. Uh, the, other th the other thought I have is I would like to see uh, information going out to the communities, <clears throat> I don't know, by PSAs or how, whatever form. Uh, we fly our community, the community, when we need to get the word out, and it's pretty effective. Uh, there are a lot of sm local small businesses that are excellent in their trades, but are never given an opportunity or they don't know about the opportunity because they just don't know about it. If there would be a way of integrating those local small businesses into some of these projects or ideas for projects that are coming out, that would be really helpful. Thank you. So Shay, as a small business person, how could we do that? Um, you know, because part of what I know about small business people is that they're they're literally doing eight jobs simultaneously seven days a week, right? Yeah, I mean that's just been my comments in the past, and what I I feel is again, there's like all this like all this going on in the chat and trying to keep up with the conversation, but basically I I feel like the whether you're a local business or not, and who's benefited from the GPLET, like, let's just be honest, it's not about local or not local, it's about income, like, that's really at the heart of the issue. If this project is a multi-million dollar project versus, you know, a small mom and pop, it, it's a, it's an income scale, right? That's, that's what's most upsetting to people, I think, is that we can all see that who has mostly benefited from the GPLET is luxury development or high-end development who has not benefited from it and who has ha a much more difficult time accessing this tool as a resource is the small business we're probably making under 500,000 or less, right? Like, and so um, at that, at these, at these very different scales, and then again, Zach and Joe are having great conversations on the side here about uh, recognizing, recognizing these different scales and how we just don't, we have these blanket solutions and we don't have custom tools that are geared to meet these very specific brackets, right? And however the community de determines those brackets, I mean, I think a lot of these tools just need more specificity, more clarification. And, and again, the specificity being who is benefiting 
and how are they, you know, and then how can they adapt to these tools to benefit that specific group? And so for a small business owner, yeah, I think some of the ideas in here are great, like getting people the legal counsel they need as a free resource if you're under making under a certain income, right? Or getting people, you know, maybe it's some of the nonprofits, like getting just a dedicated staff person to help people fill out these applications and do some of that administrative work, like whatever those solutions are, is again, what I'm, what I'm interested in hearing from people. And again, and I think what we're really talking about is these very different scales of development. And we have at this point, and have not seen the GPLET be, be used for the small or even the middle scale. It's been primarily this very large scale development. Yeah, excellent. See why she's so the piggyback on that, is it Sharia? Did I pronounce your name correctly? Sharia. Sharia. Sharia? Um, and I don't know, you know, I'm, I don't know anything about how development works, but I do know we have a couple of developers on this call and they both mentioned that, you know, how financing either pencils out or it doesn't before you can break ground. Uh, is financing currently only through, you know, big banks? I mean, do we have any kind of local lending that would help small developments get the financing for small businesses? Or is it, do you, are, we, are, are we overly reliant on big banks? David, I can answer that. We have different micro lenders in town. We have Prestamos, we have Community Investment Corporation. We have different micro lenders um, that are willing to work with the local contractors and all the small businesses, but it is difficult. Access to capital is difficult. My hope is to make a recommendation to the city so that if the expansion happens, we protect those small businesses, right? The mom and pop, the ones that don't qualify, but at the same time, we do have economic development. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult task because we wanna protect the local mom and pop, but we also want to attract investment to the city. So I really want to hear more ideas. In the past, we hear using local contractors allocating some of those fees to help small businesses. That was in the previous meetings. So what, if it happens, what should be included to protect those small businesses? Hi, this is, uh, this is Pat DeConcini. May I make a comment? Please. Um, on, on, that, on that question, this is just an idea and it may not work because I don't understand all the intricacies of, uh, of the GPLET, um, but would it be possible to establish a fund, a small business GPLET fund that would um, allocate a certain percentage of GPLET um, uh, tax abatement? And that would be specifically carved out for the smaller businesses. Um, and then that fund could potentially be used as a collateral uh, account, if you will, that um, lenders could could look to. So a lender could could look at that account and and assign some collateral attachment to one of the small businesses, giving them money that they wouldn't otherwise give, but now they can because they understand that there's a certain allocation of this uh, GPLET. Um, abatement. And it's just an idea. I don't know if that's realistic or not, but I thought I'd throw it out. Thank you. That's a great idea. Thank you, Patrick. Okay. We've got only a couple minutes left. So I'm going to take one last uh, tour through everybody. If you haven't yet spoken and have got something that really would be useful, um, please, I'm going to ask you to share it. Anybody that we haven't heard from. I'd like to make one comment when this is not totally relevant because uh, vigor and brevity go. Uh, go. Okay. The Arizona theater company it, it, it's downtown, uh, the arts, I'm an arts person and I've been supporting them for a long time. And uh, it's very, it's just as hard, if not harder to get uh, money and lending for uh, a, a good cause. That's a great cause. It's hard to get money for it. So you have to, if you, you're a small business, you have to prepare a business plan that, that a lender says, okay, I'll, I'll, buy, I'll bite. And you know, there's a lot of people are doing it. 
So if your particular small business hasn't done it or you haven't done it, find somebody who can help you with the business plan. I mean, it's not like uh, charity in a sense. You know, I mean, uh, the theater is charity. I mean, uh, and, your business is you have to make money. Yeah, and there may be ways to creatively partner on a deeper level with those community organizations that do great work for their non-business, for their small business members, but to partner more deeply between the city and those associations as a way, as a more efficient way, right? To support businesses, to communicate with businesses, to ready businesses, to level up businesses in terms of their capacity. Um, that's awesome stuff, um, awesome stuff. Okay, we were, uh, we respect and honor your time. And so the act of disrespect would be to just blur right through our commitment to you. So we got three minutes. Let me just quickly wrap it up. Next steps, here we go. Monday, because it is Friday, Monday, you will receive an email with an opportunity to provide any additional ideas, thoughts, comments. And remember, those are gonna get summarized in themes and then be included in that community-wide QA and comment document so that everyone can benefit from your ideas and wisdom. Um, secondly, in that email, you'll have an opportunity to say, yep, I wanna stay in the minivan and ride the remainder of the journey with you, receiving periodic updates and email updates. Please say yes. Stay in it because clearly uh, there's a bunch of good ideas and we, a lots to figure out, right? Finally, tell friends and neighbors, colleagues, anyone that you have within your circle of love or, and or influence to please, please complete the survey. They can do it by going on the city's website. It is in today's newspaper. Um, you photocopy it. There's PDFs that you can print out and share with everybody. All of the ward offices have them in English and Spanish. Please, 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 as quickly as possible, let's get as many voices um, engaged in the discussion by getting as many surveys complete as we can. The last thing I'm gonna ask you to do, go back to your chat. We got real high tech in the, we went, started in the chat, then we went to the high tech survey, now we're back in the chat. Still limiting you to one word. Um, but here's the thought that I'll give you. It's that I, I, a deep believer that we've all got some absolutely spectacular gift that is ours to contribute to the world. And if we go through this, it is very important to have a vision. You've got a glorious one. Um, stuff is hard. That's just the way it goes. Stuff is hard. And so really, you know, the difference between a, arriving at greatness and wishing for it is the willingness to stick through and figure it out through the hard, right? So we've all got gifts and we need to marshal every single gift that every single one of us. So in that chat, in one word, what is your gift? What is the gift that we can all look forward to receiving consistently from you as we go through this entire process, the entire journey? What is it that you're gonna contribute that's gonna make an enduring, everlasting, positive impact on the community that you love so much? What is that one word? Stick it in there. Oh, I love this, listening, nice. Two ears, one mouth. Curiosity, beautiful, vision, collaboration, creativity, passion, dedication, listening. Uh, there, there's, listen, there are a lot more of you on the call than I got words in here. Some of you are thinking that you can not do the last assignment. Nice try, nice try. <laughs> Commitments, collaboration, lots of collaboration. Perspective, <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. So let's do this thing. You've got a mayor and city council who are deeply committed to being thoughtful and in receiving information, input, guidance, thoughts from as many as they can to guide their decision making. That's what great leaders do. They say, let me be infinitely curious so that I can make a decision. They're gonna do that. They're gonna make a decision about the CBD, its boundaries. They're gonna make a decision and sets of decisions about the GPLAT and you know, how that process can be used to maximize benefit to the community. Um, it is easy to not like pieces and parts of it, but if I allow no to be the only word out of my mouth, I'm going nowhere. Because the only thing that makes possible the next conversation is a yes. And so it isn't about agreeing, you know, because that would be easy, right? We've established like great communities. It turns out they're hard to create great communities. It's a hard thing to do. And so stay in it every morning. Just look at that gorgeous face that looks back in the mirror. Remember the word that you've committed to your community. And on a daily basis, pull that word, bring it to front and look for ways to 
to infuse it in every conversation, every interaction that you have. Because I promise you, when you do that, that community that you envision 10 years from now won't be a vision, it'll be a, it'll be a promise cap. And the process that we can go through together to collaborate to achieve it will make us forever stronger. Um, and so I honor you. There's something completely spectacular about your community. I am a lucky electron rolling around your nucleus and I can see the nucleus. Um, and so thank you for the honor and privilege of uh, hanging out with you. 53 Zoom boxes. Um, I wish you a great weekend and most importantly, I wish you well. <laughs>